Grenade by Alan Gratz, Part 1, pages 67 through 73, Hideki. How to Surrender. Hideki cried as he ran. The forest around him blurred, but he kept running, stumbling blindly through the undergrowth. No matter how far he ran, he couldn't escape his memories of what had happened. The whizzing bullets, the exploding grenades, Takashi killing himself, Gensi Katsumatsa, all the other boys, dead. He didn't want to think it, didn't want to see it, but he couldn't stop seeing it. The images flashed in his mind faster than he could handle them. Hideki tripped and fell, scraping his elbows. Heart in his throat, he felt for the ceramic grenades in his pocket, but neither of them had broken. As he got to his hands and knees, he saw that he'd tripped over a log. No, not a log, he realized. A body. He scrambled away from it, his heart racing, until he backed into a blasted tree stump. He was about to get up, to keep running, when he recognized the shape of the person through his tears. Principal Kojima? Hideki asked. He sniffed and dragged his dirty sleeve across his eyes. The principal still clutched the sack full of pictures of the emperor, but now he lay next to the sack, hugging it like a pillow. Hideki approached slowly, cautiously, as though Principal Kojima might pop up and begin scolding him for speaking Okinawan and not Japanese. But Principal Kojima was dead, killed by the blast from an artillery shell. His face looked more concerned than pained. Even in death, he was still worrying about protecting the emperor's pictures. Hideki pulled out one of the pictures and looked at it. His Majesty the Emperor was a young man, with a long nose, short mustache, and round, frameless glasses. He wore a ceremonial military uniform, with fancy braids on the shoulders and arms, a silk sash across the front, and so many medals that they filled the whole front of the jacket. Hideki felt a swell of pride for his country. Principal Kojima had been doing a brave thing, protecting his majesty's mabui. Maybe Hideki could make up for his own cowardice by taking over the sacred duty and seeing the photographs to safety. Hideki repacked the photographs in the bag and found that Principal Kojima had a bit of bread and a sock full of rice tucked away too. That would come in handy. An airplane roared overhead and Hideki looked up. It wasn't a kamikaze. It was an American plane and it was dropping something. Hideki threw himself on the sack to protect it from the falling bombs. He put his hands over his head and clenched, waiting for the bombs. But they didn't come. He heard a soft rustling instead. Hideki looked up to see thousands of white pieces of paper fluttering to the ground like the cherry blossoms that fell from the sakura trees every spring. The Americans were dropping paper? Hideki caught a piece of paper and looked at it. It had Japanese writing on it. How to surrender, it said in big, bold letters. And after that, it explained how the Okinawans should approach American soldiers if they wanted to give themselves up and be protected. To make it clear you were surrendering, the leaflet said, you should stay away from the Japanese army, leave the combat area immediately, and wear something white if possible. Surrender? Hideki crumpled up the leaflet and threw it to the ground. It was like the Americans knew he was a coward and were teasing him about it. He wasn't going to surrender, and he wasn't going to let the Americans or Shigatomas Mabui tell him what to do. Almost in response, the American battleships began to range in on his location. Kathoom! 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 The bombs were getting closer every second. Hideki quickly hefted the sack onto his shoulders. He had to get away from here. But where? Hideki's mind went to the safest place he could think of. His haka, his family's tomb. Yes, it wasn't far. Hideki put his head down and ran through the falling bombs, zigging and zacking so they couldn't catch him. When he was clear of the artillery, he kept running, past the crater-filled rice paddies and burned-down farmhouses outside his village. He had been to his family tomb so many times in his life, he knew the way by heart. The Kinoshiro's haka was where they buried their dead. It was where they came to worship and celebrate them, too. Going back to it felt like going home, in a way, and gave Hideki a new sense of confidence and purpose. Three times a year, Hideki helped his father clean the tomb, 
Eventually, the job would be his, until he could share the duty with one with his own firstborn son. Where was his father now? Dickie wondered. Was he alive? Was he dead? He might never know. As he rounded the last turn to his family tomb, Hideki worried that it might not be there anymore, that an American bomb might have blasted it and all of Hideki's ancestors to bits. But there it was, just as it has always been, and his heart soared. The Kinoshira Haka was built into a hill and had a big round roof that resembled a giant turtle shell. Family name markers sat in the courtyard outside. The small door to the tomb was fronted by a narrow porch with a railing. If he looked through the frame of his fingers, Hideki could see the porch as it had been before. His extended family gathered to make their annual offerings of incense, food, and rice liquor to their ancestors and shared a happy feast with the spirits. It was one of the days Hideki most looked forward to, but they had missed it this year. Everyone had been relocated by the Japanese army or was too busy working for them, or both. The most recent time he'd been back here was with Kimiko. He and his sister had come over the winter to repeat the ritual they hoped would finally bring peace to Shigatomo and free Hideki from the influence of his ancestors' Mavui. Kimiko had noticed that Hideki was moving stiffly as they prepared the incense and offerings for the ceremony, and she pulled back the sleeve of a shirt to reveal the bruises on his arm he'd been trying to hide. Who did this to you? Kimiko demanded. Hideki looked at the floor. Yoshio, he said, a boy at school. Did you at least fight back? Kimiko asked. No, Yoshio would have beaten me up. Kimiko smacked Hideki in the head. He did beat you up, and he'll keep doing it until you stand up to him. It's Shigatomo's fault, Hideki told her. He makes me scared. Kimiko shook her head. It's not about being scared, she told him. It's about doing what you have to do, even though you're scared. She yanked Hideki's sleeve back down to hide his bruises again. She was still frowning, but her tone softened. If he does it again, come and get me, and I'll beat him up. Hideki could never do that. Let his sister fight bullies for him? The boys at school would never let him live that down. But he still hadn't stood up to Yoshio either. Kimiko just didn't understand. Hideki crawled inside the dark tomb just as it began to rain outside. He suddenly realized he might not be the first person to think of hiding out here. And he called out in Japanese, Hello? Is anyone here? He repeated his question in Okinawan, despite his fears that someone Japanese might overhear him and punish him for speaking his native language. When the Japanese had taken over Okinawa all those years ago, they'd made it illegal for the Okinawans to speak their own language or practice their own religion. Hideki, said a weak voice, and Hideki froze. Goosebumps crawled up and down his arms. Were his ancestors speaking to him? Was this the voice of Shigatomo, the ancestor whose mabui he carried? Hideki, is that you? The voice croaked again. It was an ancestor, Hideki realized with a start, but not only one nearly so old as Shigatomo. Woto, Hideki cried. It was his father.